given us such a great and glorious and perfect Savior. And as we have been studying and considering and meditating on, he is perfect in every way. He is perfect, perfectly the Son of God, and he is perfectly a man. And so we thank you that he is perfect in every way. And we thank you also, Lord, that you have, through him, purchased us, and you have created your people, you have created your body on this earth, the church, and you have blessed us with joy in serving you. You have blessed us with one another that we can encourage and exhort one another. You have blessed us in so many ways that we don't even recognize from day to day. But we thank you, Lord, for, for this day, for this opportunity, for this time that has been set apart for us once again to meditate, to reflect, and to worship. We pray, Lord, that you would help us this day. We've come here with many distractions, um, with sin, with many things that we need to lay at your feet, that we need to lay at the foot of the cross, and we pray that you would help us to do that today uh, in fellowship with one another and in fellowship with you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, I think we're going to have to do this Sunday school class the old-fashioned way. Um, so you're going to have to listen really, really hard as uh, we go through things today. Um, so the last couple classes, uh, the first, the, two weeks ago we talked about Jesus being the Son of God, His being divinity, His being divine, the divine, eternally preexistent Son of God. Last week we talked about Jesus' humanity, that He was fully a man, fully human. Um, and this week we're going to be talking about the sinlessness of Christ. Um, so that's going to be our topic today. And there was a question that was asked some weeks ago about Jesus being sinless. And how do we know? And how is that possible? And we're going to touch on some of that today. Um, so sinlessness of Christ. And you can see I used a... Uh, a bullseye. <laughs> Couldn't think of the word. Um, and so sin is sometimes described as missing the mark. Um, so I thought that would be an appropriate um, symbol for us to consider is Jesus was perfect in every way. Every time an arrow was fired, if you will, it hit the bullseye. It was perfect. And that was the life of Jesus himself. So let me read to you as we get into this. Uh, these are words of Stephen Wellam. And again, he is the primary source I've been using for this class. He says, as we have seen, the scriptures maintain that the genuineness and fullness of Christ's humanity are necessary for our salvation and for the fulfillment of God's entire plan for humanity and for the rest of creation. So God's full, uh, Jesus' fullness and genuineness in terms of his humanity are necessary for all these things. But then he adds this statement. The genuineness and fullness of his humanity, however, would not matter if Christ's humanity was not also sinless. So, yes, Jesus was fully God. He is, remains fully God. He is still fully a man. But we have this crucial issue of him being sinless. So today we're going to talk about how the Bible presents that and why that is so necessary and what the implications of that are. So... The New Testament teaches us that Jesus fully shared in our human nature as people, but not in our sin nature. He had to become all that it means to be a man, to be human, but the corruption of sin is not essential to humanity. So turn to Genesis chapter 1, just to get an idea of this. So we're looking back at creation to begin with. When God first created the world, when God first created men and women, how did he create them? So before Adam rebelled in Genesis, sin was not part of his human nature. It was not part of him being created. God originally created all things, including humanity, to be very good. So if you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, it says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold... Get your attention. It was very good. 
and there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. And then look at, uh, if you skip back a couple verses, back to verse 26. So God first created man in his, in his own image to represent God's righteous rule over this very good creation. So verse 26 and following says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock. Verse 27, so God created man in his, his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So there was not sin in the very beginning of creation when God, in particular, made men and women. Um, but then turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 11. Genesis chapter 3, verse 11 begins this, this interaction between God and um, Adam and Eve in the garden after sin had entered. Um, and you'll see that in the curses or in the consequences of sin, there's lots of, there, there are these, you kind of skip over it, but there are these words, because. So verse 14, because, and he's talking to the serpent, because you have done this, Things are going to happen. Then verse 17, in talking to Adam, to the first man, he says, because, and then he goes on to explain. So it was because of Adam's sin that, that sin entered the world. It was because of his rebellion that sin entered and all these consequences entered the world. So it was not in the beginning of creation in terms of men and women being sinners and having sin uh, accounted to them. So that's the beginning. Uh, and then Jesus enters the plot line. He comes in with these claims of being sinless. Uh, and he makes these very clear statements about himself. He, he, and he, as you read through the Gospels, you see he recognizes sin in others, but never in himself. He shows no consciousness of sin. He never prays for his own forgiveness. He commands other people to repent, but he never repents himself. And then a few of his statements, he challenges his enemies to find fault with him. Which of you convicts me of sin, he says. Very boldly puts it out there, which of you convicts me of sin? He also says in John 15 that he has kept all of his father's commands. And then when he's going to be baptized by John the Baptist, he makes a reference to fulfilling all righteousness, that he's getting baptized to fulfill all righteousness. So there are very clear statements by Jesus himself, by very explicit things that he says, by even implicitly looking at his life through the Gospels, that he is indeed sinless. So then we go to the rest of the New Testament. So turn to the book of Hebrews. And again, these are things that are not, are not shocking to us, but these are things that are true and there are things that are worth our consideration. Sometimes we, we read these things about Jesus and we can skip over them. We can, you know, we kind of take them for granted. But these are, these are crucial things for us to consider. So Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Again, this is how the New Testament comments on Jesus being sinless. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Um, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Uh, turn back to chapter 2 of Hebrews. Chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be make his, made like his brothers in every respect. And we're going to talk about that a little bit because there is some, some have disputed some of the, that application to Jesus in a certain way. But he had to be made like his brothers in every respect that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So he's able to help people in their suffering of temptation because he himself suffered temptation 
yet did not sin. Um, go to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 26 and 27. Again, this is in reference to Christ. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. So, again, there are all these proclamations of his perfection and of his sinlessness. One or more verse from Hebrews chapter 9. And again, none of this should be... It's mysterious in one sense, but we know these things. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, and again, this only has an impact, only has an effect if he was perfect, if he was the perfect spotless lamb of God. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Um, there are other verses. There, there are various verses in 1 Peter. 1 Peter refers to him as the lamb without blemish or spot. He says, Jesus committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. He also says that Jesus died the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And then 1 John has a couple of statements as well. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Um, Jesus, and then chapter 3 of 1 John, Jesus appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. There are various other verses in the New Testament that talk about this. Again, this is not new to us, but it's important that we go back, we remember these things, and see their significance as we continue in the class. So um, that is how the New Testament establishes the sinlessness of Christ. So that, okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, so creation, we talked about Jesus himself, the New Testament. Okay. So, in the last 200 years, some scholars, while maintaining the sinlessness of Christ, they have argued that his, in, in his incarnation, he assumed a fallen nature. So, let me ask you that, ask you the next question is, what does it mean to be fallen? Before we start talking about whether or not Jesus assumed a fallen nature, what does it mean to be fallen? What is the definition of that? Sarah. To have inherited original sin. Okay. All right. That's correct. Any other thoughts on that? What does it mean to be fallen? We define ourselves as being fallen. Elia. Some would say limited, um, and that's unlike Christ in that way. Okay. Um, Lim so in that sense, I think I can see where these people are coming from. Um, but I very much agree with Sarah and Sarah's definition, and thus, obviously, the definition can't hold it. Okay. Are you sure? <laughs> Clark? I think of it as, as, as having lost the right relationship with God. Okay. Cassie, did you have your hand up? I was going to say the same, separated from God. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a predisposition to evil. It's almost like gravity. Like, a fallen nature is, it's always going to have a pull. You know, gravity is always going to pull you down. There's a tendency toward evil, a leaning toward a default position toward evil, that sort of thing. So let's assume that you were hired to represent your client in the courtroom. And you have to persuade the jury or the judge that Jesus had a fallen nature. He was sinless, but he had a fallen nature. Let's see if you can do this. How would you argue that position if you were placed there? Yeah. Half his DNA is from, is from Mary. Okay. Part of, part of him is from Mary. All right. Yeah. Um, maybe you could say, like, on the cross, as God turned his face away, that he took on our fallenness. Okay. At the very end. All right. Yeah. 
say, well, Jesus was obviously subject to <coughs> world sickness, stubbing his toe, uh, subject to death. So he had endured, if he had to endure all the things we did in life, then and he was our representative, then he had to take on everything that we struggle with and yet overcome it. And so therefore he must take on our nature. Do you believe that? Oh, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would probably argue, and I don't agree that Jesus was fallen in any way, but the Bible says that nobody's tempted of God, that they're um, um, God doesn't tempt us, <coughs> that it comes from within, and the scriptures say that Jesus was tempted in all ways and yet without sin. So I'd probably try to link that. Okay. <clears throat> well, here are some arguments. He, if he did not take on a fallen nature, and by the way, he was, he would have been, he. Again, the argument is that he took on a fallen nature, but he was sinless nonetheless because he was spirit-empowered. And so even though he would have had a fallen nature, he was spirit-empowered. He was still the perfectly obedient son of God. So that's, that's what the argument would be. But the arguments in favor of him taking on a fallen nature is, and in some ways mentioned already, that he maybe would not have been fully a human being because we are fallen. He would not have been able to have sympathy with us in our temptations. He would not have been able to fully and genuinely redeem us if he did not take on a fall nature. I'll get to you in just a second, Clark. Um, so it would have been necessary, according to these arguments, for him to not only be incarnated, but also for him to reconcile and redeem us. Uh, he had to be made like us in every way, in one of the verses we just read. Um, and there's a statement made by an early church father. I mentioned it last week. The unassumed is the unredeemed, or the unassumed is the unhealed. So in order for Jesus to properly and sufficiently and adequately redeem us, he would have had to assume everything about us as people, as human beings. Um, so those are some of the arguments. Um, Clark. I think Will is impressed by your comment. I can just tell by his. <laughs> um, yes, and th that is one of the, that is where we're going to go. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some other things in the way that we talk about that this is not what we would say the scriptures teach, that we would not say that Jesus took on a fallen nature. So besides what Clark said, does anybody else have any thoughts or any arguments opposing Ellie, Ellie, go ahead. Um, at Pentecost and following, we took on the Holy Spirit. And, and yet, one of the arguments for Christ being fully human and fallen, but, without, but yet without sin, is that he was spirit-filled. And I would assume that through Pentecost, we are also also then are spirit filled and yet I sinned earlier this morning what the heck is that <laughs> yeah I mean these are all we're going to talk about a lot of the we're going to flesh these out no pun intended with being Jesus incarnate but um, so any other any other arguments against Jesus taking on a fallen nature any other thoughts you have about that yeah I have a question. yeah so 
argue for anything that happened afterwards. So it, it's really like shifting the um, debate from this one particular question to a whole bunch of questions. Yeah, you're, and you're asking a question in that? I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Um, so the argument for uh, Jesus is fallen is that if he isn't, then anything afterward cannot be accomplished. So now we need to ask the question whether anything afterward is accomplished. And that seems like a much more difficult well, yeah, where we're going now is, so what we were just talking about is, is people who would argue that Jesus took on a fall nature, meaning he didn't sin, but they would say he had, just like we are fallen, we have a propensity or, or we lean towards sin, but Jesus never sinned. Now we're talking about why, that, why we don't agree with that position. So now we're arguing against it. So we're saying that Jesus did not take on a fallen nature. Am I understanding? Am I answering your question? Am I clarifying? Okay. Jason. Um, I guess similar to what Clark is saying, fallen, you're talking about fallen nature, right? Um, yeah, uh, right now we're arguing against we're arguing this against idea of Jesus taking on a fallen. Say, I would say that fallen can be a nature, but it can also be a choice. So, right, like um, Adam was sinless. Angels, well, I don't want to go too much into that, but you know, fallen angels, whatever, right? They made their choice. Right? Christ makes his choice as well. So there's a choice behind fallen as well as fallen in nature. So I don't know, maybe I'm just muddying. Okay, and wh wh we're going to talk about that. We're going to get into that too. Um, briefly, Matt. So if one of the arguments in favor is that Christ couldn't sympathize with us if he didn't have the nature that we have. That, that, is, that assumes that, you know, that he has to have, he has to feel what we feel. That we have, he has to, in order to sympathize with us, he has to have the same pull that we have. But there's, there's a question about what really is the pull of sin. Um, do, you, do you have to have a propensity to sin and overcome it to have sympathy with us? Or is there a different kind of sympathy with somebody who doesn't have the, 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 the nature, natural pull of sin, but has to, but still has, has the, the possibility of temptation? Um, is that the sympathy that, that he needs to have for us? Joel. Uh, going back to what Clark was saying, I'd probably say that um, Christ was even more human than we are, like even more fully human because he was in perfect union with God. Yeah. That the, the um, human nature and the divine nature were perfectly united, and then he was also united with the Father and the Spirit of maturity. So the, the, yeah, Christ was like perfectly human and even more human than we can be because he was in all right, Clark. Um, also, if we say that fallenness is you know having that taint of original sin in a sense, and we just say, well, Christ didn't sin, maybe he had some kind of part of that fallenness of original sin. Well, original sin is sufficient to condemn. Like we don't we don't have to actively sin. We're already condemned because of original sin. So you couldn't you can't have that. You can't you can't have any kind of original sin. All right. Okay. Here we go. Errors of a fallen incarnation. Um, it lacks biblical support. So Jesus was born in the likeness of men. He was being found in human form, in the likeness of human flesh, of sinful flesh, it actually says. All of those things refer to our common nature, but not our corrupt nature. We already had a representative in Adam. We already had someone who fell. Jesus is not in Adam. Jesus does not have the same fallen nature. Now, a reference was made to Jesus having, you know, he was born of Mary. So he had that, but he is not, he, there is 
not, there are really, there's really not biblical support for Jesus taking on a fallen nature. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. Second thing is, and some of you have touched upon this, that if Jesus had to take on a fallen nature, it implies that corruption is essential to us. It's part of who we are. It is, but it's not part of the way God originally created and designed us. Um, so to argue that Christ, that unless Christ was fallen, he can't be fully like us, it seems to require the assumption that to be human is to be fallen, which does what to God's creation? Elia. It puts sin into it. So it really compromises, to say that Jesus had to have a fallen nature compromises the integrity of God's creation at the beginning. Because that's not the way we looked at the beginning of Genesis. That's not the way God created the world. That's not the way God created us. So fallenness is not essential to us. Um, it's not essential to us being truly human. It's an aberration in God's original plan. It's an aberration in God's, I shouldn't say an aberration in God's original plan. It's an aberration in God's original creation of us to, to say that Jesus had to take on this fallen nature in order to redeem us. Um, the next one we're going to talk about at length so I'm going to put a pin in that one. You see, I put it in parentheses. Um, to say that Jesus had to take on a fallen nature implies that temptations for an unfallen Christ were not real. What does that mean? Are you totally confused? I'm not sure I understand that statement yet. Clark, uh, Will. It, it means that because he had no fallen nature, then would not, uh, the temptations would not be effective. That's the reason. So it's, I, I'll use the, uh, the idea of a magnet, right? So we talked about gravity. If you use, you know, fallen nature in us means that there is this magnetic pull in us towards sin. The Lord sanctifies us, weakens that pull, helps us to grow in grace, helps us to grow in faith, helps us to grow in, in obedience, but there's still this pull. So if Jesus didn't have a fallen nature, was there really a pull? Was, was, his, was his resistance of temptation legitimate or genuine? We're going to talk about that. So we'll, we'll skip that one for now. But that's if you say that Jesus had a fallen nature, then that is a question to be dealt with, which we will talk about later. Sarah. Does it matter if he was like really pulled towards sin or not? He perfectly obeyed the law and he was fully human and fully God. So, like, why I, I sometimes I feel like I don't understand disagreements like this. Like, it's sort of like just semantics to me. And I don't know that there's really a way for us to fully know the answer because the Bible doesn't get that, you know, detail. Mm -hmm. And so, does it, I mean, does it really even matter? I don't know. Perhaps will. <laughs> to add to my comment, uh, because Clark whispered in my ear. <laughs> you guys are quite the pair back there going back and forth. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were not fallen when they were tempted. Right. Correct. Their temptation was real. Yeah, that's um, correct. I think I think we have in that in that that's that's because of that cell graph that God planted, he's, he's showing us that unfallen temptation in that case is real. It's real. It's meaningful. Um, Christ is the second path. Okay. Three. It makes me think of um, Gethsemane too, and that he was obedient, but he also asked that the cup would pass for him, like from him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, that scenario which we talked about last week, that is, that is, that is where you look to wrestle with this issue. Clark.
Yeah, and that's a good point because there's a lot, the early church wrestled with a lot of these issues for, pract for very practical reasons as they were looking at the person of Christ. And we, in this day, so many of these, these questions are in the mind of the Orthodox Church are settled. You know, so we talk about the sinlessness of Christ. We, we very much take that for granted. But you know, those things were wrestled in Jesus' full humanity, Jesus' full deity. How did they interact? Or how were they united in one person? I mean, these are issues that, again, the early church thousands of years ago had councils and different things, which we're going to talk about in, in the coming classes, um, to wrestle with some of these things. So yeah, I mean, but I think Sarah's right too. You're, I mean, thankfully, Jesus' life, Jesus' sinless life was etched in stone. The scriptures tell us exactly what happened. The scriptures not only tell us what happened, but they, they comment on what happened. Um, so thankfully, Jesus did not sin. Um, and we might even say that it would have been impossible for him to sin. So I'll leave that statement where it is. Robin. Mm -hmm. And his weight was far greater uh, than, than, than us human beings. And so I just think that the flesh and him being the light of the world, that his nature was of the flesh. That, I mean, that compromised me. But as far as the animal he took on so much more of temptation that we could ever understand. Mm. Well, and we'll, we're probably going to talk about it later, but I'll just say it now. And that is, in temptation, we're easy prey. I mean, we're easy prey for the devil, for the world. But yet, when you think about what you were saying with Jesus and the extent to which he obeyed his father, the extent to which he did not succumb to temptation, the devil had to pull out everything in his pockets he had, he had to try everything. He had to, he had to be relentless. He would not give up because he knew the stakes of what Jesus was doing and who he was. So, you know, we're easy prey. But Jesus, to go to your point, I mean, think about it. Think about what the devil did, things that we're aware of, his temptation in the wilderness, other things when he was on the cross. I mean, <coughs> Satan had to pull out everything. He had to exhaust himself to try to get Jesus to sin and failed in every respect. Um, so it's, I mean, it's, you think about it that way and it's, it's glorious. Um, all right, other errors of Jesus taking on fallen nature. Um, this, is a, this is a little complicated. Maybe I can do this briefly. So I mentioned earlier that one of the early church fathers said that the unassumed is the unhealed or the unassumed is the unredeemed, meaning Jesus would have had to have taken on himself a fallen nature, again, sinless, but would have had to have taken on a fallen nature in order to fully redeem us. This idea of the unassumed is the unhealed or the unassumed is the unredeemed, that was said more in the sense of opposing a heresy called Apollinarianism, which was, a, was compromising Jesus' humanity. So that statement, the unassumed is the unredeemed, was to oppose this heresy which questioned Jesus' humanity or the fullness of his humanity. And so the response was, Jesus can't fully redeem human beings unless he fully assumes human form or fully takes on a human body or is fully a man. So that statement is not used in the right context in terms of those who 
would say that Jesus had to take on a sinful nature or a, a fallen nature. Um, the idea of Jesus taking on a, a fallen nature also risks separating the human from the divine. And this also deals with a heresy um, that's called Nestorianism. And Nestorianism tried to, again, these are things, many of these heresies were in the early church, and Nestorianism tried to divide Jesus being the eternal Son of God with being incarnate. So it risks, so this idea of, of Jesus taking on a fallen nature risks separating those two things because you can't quarantine sin in somebody. So you can't say he, they took on a fallen nature and yet you have the perfect sinless son of God in the same person. Um, so Nestorianism um, tried to nullify this unity of Christ's person by saying the son of God this holy, perfect, pre-existent Son of God cannot suffer like a man, cannot endure human things. Only the human part of Christ can do that. Um, so when you have this idea of Jesus having a fallen nature, you, you, you can't keep them together. Um, you can't have a fallen nature with the eternal, perfect Son of God in the same person. Um, so again, those are maybe beyond many of us, but um, all right. The last one is, and we've touched on this already, one, another, the final error of Jesus taking on a fallen nature is that it requires that Jesus has some properties of sinfulness. And by that, some of you are, have already touched on this, having a fallen nature equal sign committing sin. So if you have a fallen nature, you're going to commit sin. There is no one in the world who has ever not fulfilled that equation in some respect and some matter. So if you have a fallen nature, you're going to sin. No one has ever defied that mathematical equation. It's always true. In some respects, bigger in some people, in some respects, smaller. But you're always going to be, if you have a sin nature, theologically, biblically, you're always going to be a sinner. All right, any comments on any of that? Or disputes with me or anything else? Yeah? I'm just trying to understand what was the, what was the inspiration for this argument to begin with? Was it to try to magnify Christ? I, I, from what I read, it, it, is, it, it is looking at it in the glass half full context. It is people trying, it is scholars and others trying to argue to glorify Christ, that he did take on a fallen nature, that he was sinless, that he is a perfect representative of people. He, he, they argue, as I said earlier, that he would have had to have done this in order to be a true person, but also to be the one who reconciles people to God. So they, they would argue it's out of necessity to be, to be in a, a to accomplish what he did as a savior. And I think Joel's point makes the most sense then because we read in Genesis chapter one that God created man <clears throat> in our image and Jesus is truly human. Like he doesn't need to represent us. He doesn't need to be tainted with original sin or assume a fallen nature because he's already the second Adam. Mm -hmm. He's the true representative of humanity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sarah. Because logically, you'd sort of have to, like, from that, argue that he would have to, like, fully represent each individual human being and their individual. I mean, it gets kind of absurd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, that to its logical conclusion. Right. So, <clears throat> all of us, all of us have different. We experience the power of temptation in different ways. Um, our spiritual opponents in the heavenly places, they. They know us, they know what gets us. Um, the world comes at us, things, certain things pull at you that might not pull at me and vice versa. And Jesus didn't have to experience every single temptation in every way at all times in order to be sufficient to be our high priest and in order to 
to sympathize with, with us in our temptations. Matt. So just, just to kind of put a, a little bit of a qualification on here, there have been um, solid theologians in history who've wrestled with this question. You know, we shouldn't, act, we shouldn't treat it like this is just stupid, mm -hmm. right? First of all, we're dealing with a mystery. We, we don't, we, we, it's, it's incomprehensible on one level to us what Christ's, what it was like for Christ to have one person and two natures and what those two natures were actually like and how he experienced life in a fallen world but he wasn't fallen, what kind of what we're saying. Mm -hmm. um, so he was subject to things we were, were, were subject to but not all of the same things we're subject to. And there's a mystery here. And I think the motivation of the theologians who thought along these lines is Christ has to help me overcome my weakness. In order to help me overcome my weakness, he had to experience my weakness in, in order to overcome it. And so he overcame, you know, the, the thought is if he had my fallen nature he, and yet he overcame it, he can help me overcome Comment. That's kind of the motivation mm -hmm. in the thinking. But I think they're trying to peer a little bit too far into, into Christ and, and not fully taking into account what fallenness means. And, and really, the, a fallen human nature means not able not to sin, which I, I think is where, probably where you're going with things. Meaning, you, you already have a, an original nature of sin that is condemnable. Uh, you cannot not sin as a human being. When Christ came, he was able not to sin. Um, if anything, we could say, and, I, and maybe the, I don't know if this is where you're going, but if anything, we could say what, what humanity Christ took, took on, having uh, a virgin mother, but God as a father, is original human nature that was able to sin, but not with the fallen nature, not able not to sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is heavy stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, and and yes, I think there is there is much mystery in this, um, and sometimes we can, you know, we we get to that proverbial, you know, brick wall. And sometimes we can try to push it too far. And sometimes we just need to stop and just worship and thank God that Jesus is who he is, accomplished what he did. The scriptures say that he is able to sympathize with us in our temptations and in our weaknesses. And thank God that the scriptures truly say that. But there is much mystery in this, and you know, is it worthwhile pushing the, that brick wall sometimes? Sometimes it's not, and we just need to, to thank God and take him at his word and believe and trust. Um, speaking of pushing that brick wall, Will, we're about to do that in a minute. Will. And, and I'm, not, I'm not a church historian, nor do I claim to be an expert on the early church issues, but some of these people, like, they're almost too smart for their own good. Like, just stop. Stop. Take the word of God for what it is and believe it and trust in this, this perfect Savior that we have. Um, all right, we're going to skip over some things. Yes, Michelle, go ahead. Okay. But with the early church people, many of them, their desire was to know and understand and see the beauty of Christ and the wonder and explain the wonder of the mystery because in explaining the wonder of the mystery, somehow that's going to make Christ more beautiful. And as 
I'm listening and not in full comprehension of all of the arguments and the names and everything. I keep thinking to myself, I want to see Christ move you. And maybe that's just <coughs> in the mystery. But to make Christ more beautiful every day in however that is. For me, it's in the mystery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but for others, it's in following this argument and coming up with something that just is amazing because they've been given a glimpse of more beauty in that direction. Like different minds work different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. Some of us. Christ be made more beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, again, that brick wall, you're like, I, I can't, my mind can't comprehend or get into this any further. I'm just going to, you know, God is glorified, and other people want to push that to glorify him more. So we're not going to talk about this. That's a whole topic. Uh, Jesus, sinless, innocent, his virgin conception. Um, we are going to talk about the temptations of Christ. So a couple of things we want to establish, first of all, is that Jesus... He never actually sinned. Jesus was genuinely tempted. And then God cannot be tempted with evil and cannot sin. These are all reflected in what the scriptures teach us. So the question comes then, the temptations of Christ. Were the temptations of Christ real? Were they genuine? If they were real, how were they real if Jesus did not have a fallen nature? <coughs> did I see a hand? Somebody going to risk their first attempt at this? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like Clark said. I mean, Jesus is the second Adam. So Adam was a true free agent. He did not have a corrupted human nature, and yet he sinned. So Jesus, being the second, second Adam, was born without a fallen nature, a true free agent, and that he could be tempted by evil, but he did not have a corrupted nature that would be a default towards evil. So just as Adam failed in the covenant of works, Christ fulfilled the covenant of works as the second Adam, representing humanity. Sarah? I agree with, I agree with everything he said. And just to add to that, that you see in the first temptation, what was offered to Eve was that she could be like God, and knowing good and evil. And she took the fruit and gave it to Adam, and he also ate. And then in Christ's temptation, and this isn't the only temptation, but when Satan comes and tempts him, he's offered all the kingdoms of the world by Satan. And in his humanity, how could he not desire that? I mean, that just in the same way that in their humanity, Adam and Eve desired to be like God. And so, yeah, I mean, it, to, I, I, I think that you can very um, persuasively argue that he was actually tempted. There was a desire, perhaps a desire there, or it, it, that he, he wasn't an auto automaton that was just like, I do not want this. Do you know what I mean? Like, there, you know, he had feelings. He was, a, he was fully human as well as fully God. But he successfully overcame that. Um, instead of giving into it the way that the first advent. Oh, yeah. And I think, too, um, what, when we consider, well, there's kind of a main point and also a side point when we consider Jesus' temptation versus Adam and Eve's temptation. Um, the side point is that each of us, because we're different people, have to be tempted differently in order to like really get us. But um, <coughs> I'll elaborate that by saying the main point that he, Adam and Eve were tempted by, by this promise of if you disobey, then you will be made like Christ, like, like God. Um, and that would not, that simply would not have worked with Jesus because he was like, well, I, I already am. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. That's just what I was thinking as I was listening to you. So time is short. I see a lot of hands. Um, let me go through this, and we can talk later, if you want to, about some of these things. 
So in terms of whether or not Jesus' temptations were real and genuine, Jesus was tempted in, first of all, in the fact that he, as has already been mentioned, he was in human weakness. Uh, he had sinless human weakness, so he could be tempted in terms of hunger. We talked about this a little bit last week. In terms of hunger, turning stones into bread. He could be tempted in terms of fear of pain, fear of death, which was part of the Garden of Gethsemane when he was wrestling with that. So he could be tempted in, in the sense of the sinless, sinless human weaknesses uh, that were part of who he was. But he would also be tempted, and Elia touched on this, the temptations that Jesus had were unique to him as the Son of God incarnate. Um, so he could have used his divine prerogatives to do all kinds of things rather than walking in the path of obedience. So he chose to live in dependence on God, his Father, in order to become, as Hebrews 2 tells us, a merciful and faithful high priest on our behalf. So the temptations for Jesus as, the, as this unique man God that he was and is, he was tempted to, first of all, he did not want to lose communion with his father. You can see that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, he was about to be separated due to bearing the shame and the weight and the ugliness and the vileness and the wretchedness of sin. He was about to be separated from his father. And he was tempted to forgo the path of obedience to keep that relationship. And in some ways, we know what that's like. We, sometimes we would rather stay in church and sing and fellowship than go do what God has for us obediently out in the world to witness to people, to do things that are hard for us. We would rather stay on the mountaintop, in essence. So perhaps as Jesus' unique position as the Son of God, he was tempted to, to forego the work that his Father had given to him. He was tempted to, to be in conflict with his Father. Let this cup pass from me, he would say. Or he did say. Um, so that is an example of perhaps some of the unique temptations that Jesus had. And one, one writer says it this way. He was not being called upon to mortify a lust. He was being called upon to frustrate the holiest aspiration of which man is capable. So, again, it's a mystery. Um, but he chose to be this obedient son to... While this potential of conflict with his father arose, he walked the path of obedience. He did not succumb to that temptation to stay on the mountaintop, to avoid the pain and the anguish and the separation from his father. He stayed the path of obedience. Um, so I hope during this class that, that we've spoken truth about Christ. These things are hard. They're hard intellectually. They're hard with much mystery. But the bottom line is that Jesus did not sin. He perfectly obeyed his Father. Um, he perfectly redeemed us. Um, you know, and as Sarah said, you know, Eve was tempted to become like God. Jesus did the opposite. He became the lowest to redeem us. Even though he was God, he denied all those temptations and he became the lowest. Not just death, but death on a cross. Um, so those are, those are things for us to remember, to meditate on, to give him the glory for. So let's pray. Lord, we ask you, Lord, to help us with these things and that we would at the end of all this, seek your glory, seek your exaltation, seek to worship you as the perfect, spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we pray, Lord, I pray that whatever we talked about today, that there would be some clarity with that, that we would see your glory, 
that we would want to know you more, we'd want to worship you more, we'd want to have you make we'd want to have you make us to be more like you and like this perfect son of God. We pray now, Lord, as we go to worship that you would focus focus us on your glory, your power, your redemption, and how all of these things were worked out in truth and how your plans did not fail and they will never fail. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.